So we confess our sins because God forgives as God chooses. Let us live into God's mercy and confess our sins together using the prayer written before you. Bread of heaven, forgive us for seeking sustenance elsewhere. Forgive us for ignoring you as a source, as a resource. Forgive us for drawing inspiration from places other than what your will and spirit provides. Forgive us for eating all banquets and judging powerless or stubbornness. You expect more of us, Lord. Give us the good sense to look to you for nourishing our minds, our hearts, our relationships, our beliefs, our hopes, and our church. In the great name of Jesus Christ, we will pray this morning. Thanks, O God, that you hear us and you answer all of us. Amen. So God was at work not only back in the early church, but also now. The Spirit of God is still changing hearts and fashioning the world. My brothers and sisters in Christ believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. So the peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with us all. Amen.
So, can you smell it? <laughs> well, I promise it's not to torture you, because I'm suffering the same way as you are. But it's a reminder that, that God wants us paying attention, not just to what we hear, and not just to what we see, um, not just to the things that draw our attention in the moment, but to try and focus on all of them. You see, the reason that we often see in the Bible these images, um, for example, of bread being used as a way to talk about faith and to talk about spirituality is because it's meant to be a multi-sensory deal. We're supposed to be able to experience God with all of the senses that God instilled in us. And so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about eating. Because after all, everything eats, doesn't it? And I mean everything. Amoebas, the trash compactors, people, everything eats. Right? And, and everything doesn't eat the same thing, and not everything is nourishing in the same way as it might be for some, something else, right? Because the things that, say, a pig eats isn't necessarily what's nutritious for me, right? It shouldn't be. And yet somehow I can still eat a pig. How does that work? But with that in mind, what is it that you feed the things that eat in your life? What do you feed your anger? What things do you feed your beliefs? What is it that you feed your perspective, your ways of thinking about things? How do you nourish the things on which you place your foundations? And how do you decide what is nourishing? I mean, really. How do you decide if something is good for you? And is it relative? Is it really relative? I mean, yeah, I can say that I like chocolate ice cream, and you might say you like vanilla, but that's not really the same question. I mean, that's preference, but to the question of nourishment, I can't simply say that poison is good for me and then make it so. I mean, just because I eat poison doesn't mean that it won't kill me, right? And, and so there's an extent to which truth kind of goes beyond us. It goes beyond what we believe. It goes beyond what we think we know. And it goes beyond what we think we can see. Thankful. And in that vein, what is nourishing for us really comes down to a few things. First, sometimes we think if it sounds good... It must be good. When you hear steak sizzling on the grill, what do you think? It's good. Mm -hmm. Right? But you haven't even tasted it yet, right? But I mean, in your head, you're going, yes, let's get there. Right? But then, if it looks good, right, that makes it good, doesn't it? Y'all remember this? Back several years ago, Heinz came out with different colored ketchup. They had green, they had purple. They had blue. In fact, one company even had Carolina blue, if you believe that. And, and the thing is, if you tasted it, it tasted exactly the same. It did. If you closed your eyes and just tasted it, you couldn't tell that you weren't eating ketchup. And yet, just looking at it, people couldn't do it. That purple goop that was on their fries, they were like, I'm sorry, but you got to bring me some more. I can't do it. Even though it didn't taste any different, it matters what things look like. It does. And it certainly matters if it smells good, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes. yes. I mean, really. I mean, if you're sitting there and you're trying to eat something but it smells like sour milk, are you going to eat it? Why not? <laughs> it gets in the way. But, you know, for all the different ways in which we judge whether or not something will be good, shouldn't it matter most to us whether or not it actually is good? Shouldn't it matter when we put it on the plate whether or not it's actually going to do harm or if it's going to help our body? And the same thing is true for our minds and our hearts. Whatever we consume in terms of media, in terms of news, in terms of opinions, or whatever it is, Whatever it is that we're eating, is it helping us or is it harming us? 
Is it actually good for us? Now, in our scripture reading, the Pharisees have been feeding themselves the belief, right, that they are the sacred gatekeepers. That they are the ones. They have this idea that because they are in the ancestry of Israel's leadership and because they've had all of the... Um, all of the privileges and, and the, the lineage and all the things that they can point to, they are the ones who are in charge of the salvation of the nation. They are the ones who get to decide what is godly and what is not. Then you have the Romans. They've been getting fat on the idea of power and dominance. And why not? They've been winning. At this point in their administration, the Romans had conquered virtually all. Their power was unquestioned, and even though every now and then there was resistance, it was always summarily crushed. Rome was powerful. And they were drunk with what they fed themselves. And then, of course, the people. Okay, come here. There was the people. They had this idea that they were right to be afraid. And in feasting and fear and regurgitating this idea that there was nothing they could do to change things, they didn't change anything. They basically allowed themselves to believe, again, that there was nothing that they could do. Do we do that nowadays? Do we say to ourselves, well, that's bigger than me. Well, there's nothing I can do about that. My vote doesn't matter, or whatever. What do we feed ourselves? Then Jesus offers this alternative. He offers this alternative to the ways they thought about things spiritually, to the ways they thought about things politically, and to the ways they thought about things interpersonal. And in the midst of all of these different ways of looking at life, Jesus offers the bread of life. He even goes so far as to say, I am the bread of life. But the leadership didn't buy it. The Pharisees didn't buy it. I mean, they listened to Jesus and they thought, well, wait a minute. You know this guy. He's, he's married Joseph's son, you know, the, the carpenter, and he grew up here. How can he say that he came down from heaven? They believed that they knew enough about him that they were able to look on him and actually look down on him. They didn't see someone who was their peer or equal. They looked at someone who was beneath them. He didn't smell good to them. Look, the Romans didn't buy him either. I mean, they looked at Jesus and they saw someone without the benefit of an army or an empire behind him, and they considered him insignificant. He didn't look good to them. And he didn't sound good, right? Unlike the beeping that's telling us that the bread is ready, <laughs> right? I, mean, I don't know who that is, but we probably should get that for a but, um, but unlike the... Unlike the, the manna that came down from heaven, Jesus was comparing himself to this, but he was saying that he wasn't just manna. He was saying he was better, because the manna they ate, they all eventually died. But eating the bread that he offered meant that you were going to have eternal life. Can you imagine what it was like for the people listening to him? I mean, really. If I came in this church, and I walked through the doors and said, Listen, y'all, I am the bread of life. Eat me, and you will live forever. Come on. How would you react? Yeah, 911, get out of here, or whatever. I mean, you would not believe them any more than they did. So let's not kid ourselves just because we're on this side of the cross. Because I'm telling you, Jesus came in and said that today. Whether or not we believe it would depend on whether or not we even recognize Jesus in our midst. And even if we did, would we buy into what Jesus was saying? 
And so it's no wonder then that people walked away. It's no wonder then that people thought, this is too much for me. And later in the chapter, they just decided, okay, I can't be a disciple anymore. When presented with the challenges of the gospel, I wonder, do we walk away? Rationalizing what should or shouldn't apply to our lives, treating the demands of God's heart like a buffet that we can pick and choose those parts of the Christian life that we prefer. But I wonder when presented with the entire cacophony of what Jesus, what God desires of us, if we were to really try and live all of that out, I wonder how differently our lives might look. Because like the bread that's baking in the sanctuary right now, our faith is far more deliberate than that. It matters what ingredients we use. It matters how patient we are with letting the bread rise. It matters the temperature that we set for baking. It matters how well we tend the process. And then we actually, we actually have to eat it, right? In other words, we can't claim to be Christian and only accept parts of the Bible. We can't claim to be Christian and cut short the time that we would spend in prayer or at church or at home searching the scriptures. We can't claim to be Christian if we only assent to the value of Christ's ideas without actually trying to live them out. It was one of my chief complaints when some of the Jehovah's Witnesses that came to my house um, a couple years ago, they were presenting the Word, which is great, but then I said, but how is the Gospel affecting your life? Well, what do you mean by that? <coughs> Are you actually doing any of the things that Jesus prescribed? Are, are you going to visit people in the prison? Are you going to help feed people who are hungry? Are you giving your coat to people who don't have one? Are, are you doing the things that Jesus actually said that we should be doing. Because if we aren't, who's kidding who? Why in the world can we claim that we are eating of the bread of life when we're starving ourselves of what it demands? As the psalm says, we must taste and see that the Lord is good. But look, how do we get around this language? Okay, because it sounds like cannibals. One of the things that the early church was accused of back in the day, especially around um, communion, you know, when we say, this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you, we're eating the body and blood of Christ. And people overhearing it would go, really? We still use that language today, but we understand it, we don't even blink at it, but the truth is, it sounds kind of crazy. But we're not talking about cannibalism. Jesus is talking about his life. And eating the bread that Jesus offers means our life. A life spent not just consuming food, but being food for others. A life not just getting nourished, but being nourished. A life spent choosing every day to be good. Because it matters. Today, my brothers and sisters, is the anniversary of the events in Charlottesville, Virginia, today. And in the midst of all that had taken place, um, one of the professors at the university um, said this, there is a fine line between wanting to do no evil and believing you can do no wrong. Like the bread of life that Jesus offers us, our faith is not something that will grow passively. It requires action, deliberate, purposeful action. And, and so the bread of life then fills our senses with goodness. The bread of life fills our desires with satisfaction. The bread of life invites us to choose well what we eat. The bread of life teaches us to do the same for all of us. So let us indeed taste and see that the Lord is good. And then my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us actually be good. In the name of the one who continually seeks to feed us. Amen. And so our hymn of response is number 401 from the Glory to God hymnal. 
It's in an insert on page five in your guides to worship if you need the music. The song is Here in This Place. Let's sing together. So, God, there are many, there are many things that we could approach you and to give you thanks. We could give you thanks for being able to get out of bed this morning. Give you thanks for the air, the very air that we breathe, the sun that we enjoy, the rains that replenish and nourish. Lord God, we could give you thanks for the ability to see, the ability to smell and appreciate the bread that is baking from the gifts you have already provided to the earth and to us. Lord God, we give you thanks. 
And if all of that wasn't enough, O oh God, you seek our good and you send us Christ. Not only that we might be saved for hereafter, but that we might be saved in the moment. That we might nourish and make whole our thinking, heal our hearts, and in drawing closer to you, draw toward one another and recognize the family that you are trying to build. Lord God, help us to be a part of what you are doing. Let us be nourishing as well. In the words that we speak, the actions we take, even the thoughts that we bear, all be pleasing to you. And lift up to you as sweet a smell as we are having now. We pray this, O oh God, not in some empty way. But we pray it acknowledging that we will falter. That we are not going to always get it right. That we will sometimes stray away from what you would have us know, from what you would have us do. We do know this. But we also know, O oh God, that you are faithful. And that you do not abandon us. And so help us. Help us now. Help us then. Help us always. That we might be the children of your dreams. And we seek this not just for ourselves, of course, for all of those who celebrate and are in need among your people. And so we lift up to you, Jamie, who has a slip disc, as well as Ellen, whose medicine and neurologist are both acting up on her. We also pray for the man and for the delay that is taking place in the surgery that was to take place tomorrow. Both for her nerves and of those supporting her. And Lord God, may everything fall, fall into place. We also continue to pray for Tom and for Daryl, for the family of Joe Webb and for the family of Sarah Rose, for the family of Dottie Scott, as well as the environment. We lift up to you A.B. as he is in rehab and Carol as she continues to map out what's supposed to happen next. We pray for our staff person of the month, Neil, and for his gifts, and for his heart, and for everything that he does for our church. We are grateful for him. And of course, we continue to lift up to you Mary and Penny, Lynette and Susan, Summer travelers, George, especially his daughter um, with her car accident, and for Pat and Tom. We lift up to you our youth as they are helping with worship even now at Bethany. And we ask that you be honored by all. This we pray, O oh God, in the name of the living bread, the bread of life, Jesus Christ, who nourishes us, who feeds us, who teaches us. Even how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of sending is both a prayer and a promise. It is hymn number 232, God be with you.
Also, the flowers that you see are what remains from the funeral yesterday, and the family invites us to take them and to give them to any who might need them. And so to those who are shut in, those who might need some encouragement, any of you are encouraged to take any of these and give them away. This is your seed. And so, the bread of life fills our senses with goodness. The bread of life fills our desires with satisfaction. The bread of life invites us to choose well what we will eat. The bread of life teaches us to do the same for all others. And as we go about being nourishing and feeding, may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, for our hearts and minds this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace and eat well. Thank you.